Okay, thank you everyone. Good morning. All right, so first of all, I want to thank you again for welcoming me to New Zealand. And uh, on behalf of uh, both of our countries, thank our two national football teams for uh, not qualifying for the World Cup so we can be bright-eyed and bushy-tailed here uh, this morning. I was uh, ribbing the Aussies when I got here on Wednesday last week about their name, the Socceroos, and they said, to, I said, it's kind of a silly name. They said, well, it's kind of silly you didn't, you're not even in the game, so. <laughs> All right. So, as I said yesterday, um, I'm going to uh, get to the point. Uh, there's three topics I will be covering today. The first is digital forces and what they're driving um, in terms of transformation uh, across the globe and in, in the fields of technology. The impact to business models and technology and how that applies specifically to payments and some of the things we're seeing at, at ACI. And then finally, how we transform and lead our organizations or our teams, squads, you name it, um, in this new digital culture. In the process, I'm gonna actually give you three books to read. Um, we're going to watch a movie, and you're going to get a homework assignment at the end. So are you ready? All right. <laughs> okay. So technology has always progressed in step functions, mainframes to desktops, desktops to laptops, laptops to smartphones, and the underlying components of technology have, have evolved along with that. Uh, processing, storage, networking, things we're all familiar with. With each step function of technical innovation, the technology became both easier to use as well as broadened usage. Um, and those are two Im very important points. However, in 2007, um, that arguably changed. And what happened was both speed and ubiquity combined in the form of a single platform. And I'll give you a few examples of some of the, the things that happened specifically in 2007 that launched us into what we call the age of accelerations. So in that one year, Apple launched and introduced the iPhone, Hadoop was created, Twitter was launched, and just a year earlier, Facebook was opened up beyond American University students, Google launched Android, Amazon released the Kindle, and that year the internet hit a billion users. One heck of a productive year. Things were also happening in other technical fields. For example, um, 2007 was, was really the beginning of the, the clean energy launch, wind power, LED lighting, biofuels, electric cars. In healthcare, in early 2000s, it took over $100 million to completely sequence the human genome. In 2007, that dropped um, exponentially down to $1,000. And today, in the US at least, you can get a kit for $50 in the mail that sequences your, your genomics and where you came from. So there's no question we entered the age of acceleration. So let's explore that idea a little bit more. Um, and I, I, I thought this graph actually perfectly illustrated what we are um, really trying to manage both in our, our businesses and our lives. This graph was created by a guy named Eric Astro Teller. Some of you may have heard of him. He is the CEO of Google X Research, or also affectionately referred to in that company as the captain of Moonshots. Pretty cool title. And what he did was he plotted time on the x-axis and rate of change on the y-axis. And he plotted two lines. Um, the first was technical innovation. So back in this, the 1900s and you know even up to probably 20, 30 years ago, technical change happened at the rate of every 20 to 30 years. You all familiar with the introduction of the automobile, airplanes, so on and so forth. Today, that's happening at the rate of every five to seven years. And if you believe in Moore's law, it's accelerating, it's, it's, even, it's even having. And we certainly know that in, in our industry. 
The second line he plotted, which we often don't talk about and, and think about, is humanity and how human beings, both as individuals as well as societies, adapt to these changes. And these changes include both technology, geophysical, our, our environment, as well as socially. So again, historically, that took one generation to absorb a major change. Today, that's happening at the rate of 10 to 15 years. So now the important point, the dot, um, and that's a very important dot. What it represents is that the rate of technical change is actually accelerating faster than the average rate that human beings can absorb. It's why in many cases when we work and as we're interacting with our friends, we always feel like we're trying to keep up and not with a Kardashian reference there. <laughs> So my first reading recommendation to you is Thank You for Being Late. It's an optimist guide to the age of acceleration. It's a phenomenal book if you want to read more about this. So with, hum with technology advancing every five to seven years and humans adapting every 10 to 15 years, it really leaves us and our organizations, whether it's regulators, our businesses, our communities, at a, a crossroads. We can push back, stick our heads in the sand, or we're faced with confronting, really rewiring our societies and institutions so we can keep pace. I chose the picture of a skier because we're really no longer in the age of static stability. We're really in the age of dynamic stability. And I'll use the example of learning to ski around how we have to think about our organizations and how we respond to our, our customers' needs. So you're all familiar with the learning cycle. Experimenting, learning, applying the knowledge that we learn, failing and failing again. So when you're learning to ski, you first start by standing still. Um, and you're taught to fail, to actually to fall. So that when you fail, you fail fast and you're not spending all your time on the bum on, on the ski hill. You're also taught about how to wear your equipment properly. So, so when you fail, it costs less. You lose equipment less, you can spend more time skiing. Eventually, you get comfortable on the hill snow plowing, um, then parallel skiing. And I think skiing is a perfect, perfect analogy because being constantly in motion is normal. In fact, when you ski fast, it's actually easier. And that's, I think, what we're confronted with in the age of accelerations. So let's shift gears to what that means to our business models. And I'll continue with the, the theme of, um, of skiing and, and a ski resort. Historically, if you look at traditional economics, they were single-sided. Companies or um, organizations took inputs, produced goods or services for their customers. It was a single-sided interaction, single-sided business. Today, that's no longer the case. What we're confronted with is business models with multi-sided platforms. And I was really encouraged in my conversations yesterday and in this market that many of the banks are talking about their businesses as, um, as platforms as well as the, the intermediaries. So the main focus of a platform business is attracting customers to the platform and selling to them on profitable terms. Arguably the most important input of a multi-sided platform is the customer themselves. We'll use an example of a simple card transaction. There's the money side of the platform, the merchant who pays for the transaction, and then there's the subsidy side of the platform. Subsidy doesn't necessarily mean free, however it can be, where consumers don't necessarily know that they're paying for that transaction. In some cases, they're actually rewarded to use a certain card for the transaction. So successful multi-sided platforms, as we know, um, have really three main characteristics. 
The first is that they're able to early on ignite critical mass to their platforms. And that's a huge challenge and barrier of entry to platform businesses. And there's three strategies you can use to ignite business on your platform. The zigzag strategy, so YouTube employed that by creating both content as well as audience and having the audience create the content in some cases. There's a two-step strategy like Open Table, who brings all the restaurants in the market to their platform, then opens it up to consumers to attract them to the platform. The third strategy is a commitment strategy. So an example of this are the video game um, councils like Sony or Microsoft who produce the council and open it up to video game companies who can produce games um, for their, their video platform. And this is happening all over the world through different, different platform businesses. The second successful criteria for a multi-sided um, platform business is pricing. And this arguably becomes one of the key levers and what's so sensitive about a platform with this broad network effect. So it's important to price both for the ignition phase as well as then the long run. And there's different pricing strategies that you can use during the life cycle of the platform and aspects of the platform that are, are going live. Then finally, successful multi-sided platforms understand the context of both the ecosystems and the environments in which they operate. They enable both where and how participants interact, but equally important, provide a governance framework across the platform so users are, are comfortable and trust the platform. We know we have plenty of examples of this with, with consumer reviews on many of our consumer marketplaces. So the second reading recommendation I'll give to you is a book called Matchmakers. Um, it delves into the economics and a lot more detail pricing strategies around um, running, operating, and growing multi-sided platforms. So what does this mean in payments? Um, and we're, we're seeing a couple, of, uh, a couple of trends, some of which were touched on earlier in the day. The first and what I always put in the center is uh, making sure customers, your customers understand your business and, um, and your purpose. I thought we heard that last night very eloquently from the, the gentleman that, that got the last speaker of the, uh, um, the evening. And I'll talk a little bit about more about that in, um, in, the, in the next topic when we get into culture. But historically, payments business models really relied on um, two key drivers, and I put those in the orange circle. The first is really deeply understanding customer loyalty as well as customer value. So providing a rich, um, both digital as well as, you know, what we call, refer to as omni-channel experience. It's helping our customers understand their customers, not just the short-term transaction, but also the lifetime value of the customer. And I'll talk a little bit more um, new business models we're seeing that, um, that support and capture some of that profit. The second is really understanding the broader perspectives that customers have today. It's not just local anymore. The competition really is no longer the guy next door. It's really, what did I just experience when I, I purchased on, on Amazon? And that's how a lot of our retailers and billers are, are thinking today. Equally, in what we just heard from Layla is the importance of our continued investment in both security and fraud protection. And there's no question fraud is growing in the digital channels, and that's where, as, um, as retailers and billers, we need to focus our, our investment. So what are some of the new business models and opportunities that, um, that we're seeing? And I I'll highlight really four areas. And the reason I put them in the outer circle is I do believe this will drive growing the payments uh, profit pool, if you will. 
So the first is open APIs. So um, we've heard a lot about, there's actually a, a workshop next door um, on, on open banking, but I think open APIs present um, some very interesting challenges to our existing business model. Open APIs enable an open collaboration with fintechs, but equally with our customers in different ways. Also both traditional as well as non-traditional traditional players in the ecosystem that we really have to think through how we, how we profit and, and help one another. They're both a source of new customers to our platform, but equally they can be a threat and we have to think about them in, in both ways. The second area I'll call out is payments, data, and insights. In the age of accelerations, there's, as we saw from the examples I gave earlier, there's really one direction um, for revenue and cost, and that's down. However, we can preserve the profit model by offering new things like insights to our customers through the data that we're, we're entrusted to, um, that we're entrusted with, if you will. And that can help them grow their businesses and, and they see a lot of value in, uh, in those services. So important to think about that in context of the platform. Third topic is real time. We just heard a lot about that in, uh, from the Australian market. And I, I would argue this, this set of economies between New Zealand and Australia are really leading the way in, um, in many ways, especially relative to what's happening in uh, uh, or the slow start we've got in the United States. I, I think um, if, if I could tell you the uh, silver bullet use case for driving real-time adoption, um, I'd be much more active on the speaking circuit. But I think there's, there's really two things that we see in um, specifically in the U.S. market that are driving that push. The one is these integrated commerce companies and specifically the proliferation of the Internet of Things. And we're seeing that across a couple different industries. In government, we have um, the automatic tolls that we're seeing lever interested in leveraging real-time payments. And also in some of the, the non-traditional um, payment innovators like insurance companies. There's a lot of, um, in our market, interesting work around aggregating payments and doing multi-party disbursement with, with real time that we're experimenting with um, in terms of some proof of concepts and in, in, uh, um, with, with, with ACI. So real time, I think, is um, this will be some of the next wave of the, the innovation. It's no longer going to be um, a trend, but it's really going to be table stakes in terms of how economies compete in the age of acceleration. Then finally, I included up here um, alternative or new payment types. And the global market for alternative payments is growing at a rate of 13% annually. So I think a couple of things I'd say about alternative methods of payments is that um, there's a wide variety of choice right now. I think what's important is identifying the customer use case, the problem we're trying to solve, and, and then leveraging um, alternative payments to do that if it's, if it's relevant. But there's no question there's some real traction there from the alternative um, payment types. Okay. So how then do we transform our organizations to compete in this age of accelerations as well as new, these new business models? So I've distilled this into three very simple concepts that we use in ACI, and I'll give you a few examples of organizations across the globe who have successfully implemented them. So I'll give you my last reading recommendation, and I'll start with um, two magical words that really helped us change some of the culture at ACI. That's radical candor. And what that stands for is challenging directly, but caring personally. It basically opens the door for teams to create a culture of feedback. And team members will actually use those two words with me. Carolyn, I need to give you some radical candor because it's not about how you say it, it's what you're saying. So the importance of radical candor is really 
enforcing with teams the importance of achieving their fullest potential, and but equally important, driving those results collaboratively. And that really has made a huge difference in our organization around creating a culture of feedback. The second then is harnessing that feedback into what I call the checklist manifesto. And checklists are something so easy um, as human beings we can understand across cultures, across borders, and they're rewarding. We feel good when we check things off the checklist. But as I said at the beginning, the volume of what we're faced with in our businesses has exceeded any of our individual knowledge and ability. So it's important to build that into checklists, processes, procedures, so that we protect not just against failure, but an important message around raising the baseline of performance within our teams. It's important that we codify what needs to happen, but then through radical candor, leverage feedback and give our teams um, the ability to apply their best judgment against the checklist. Then finally, that results in an outcome of cooperation and respect. And I would argue in this day and age, um, especially in the age of social media, respect is really one of our new human currencies. Um, it's something that we both give and receive, and it's very meaningful in our society. It's meaningful to our customers, to how we interact with each other, as well as our communities. And this topic around building um, and improving the cultures within our organizations um, you know, has really become incredibly important in light of things like the Me Too movement. Um, so our, our uh, National Association of Corporate Directors this year has picked a theme of, of culture and organizational culture as one of the biggest risks and opportunities that our organizations face. Likely regulators um, are, going, are thinking through some of the same things as we bridge the gap between um, that dot and where we are and our ability to, to, uh, um, to absorb the change that's happening around us. Okay, so I think one closing thought on, on ING, I think um, the transformation that ING has gone through, which is well known um, in our industry, is, is really impressive. I think the three things that they've done that are really unique is they've then used that to attract partners to their organization. They've used it to attract customers, um, as well as retain and attract uh, highly valued employees. So really impressive whether you use Agile or customer experience experience is your battle cry. Um, I think that uh, um, what they've done at ING is really impressive and, and, and well recognized. So my parting thought to, uh, um, to help you make it count. Um, I uh, was challenged a few years ago at an a education thing I went to that you should be able to um, to articulate your business in a single sentence. So I would encourage all of you, you can write it down or you can type it in on your mobile, but be able to write out what you're working on today or about your business, complete this sentence for the target segment or account that you're currently working on. Your product provides the most important customer benefit to these people at the customer, so your buyers and users, because of the key features that your, your solution or activity provides. So I'd encourage you all to do that and um, to talk to someone new at the conference to challenge your thinking around this. With my last parting thought, you don't have to be perfect, just be better every day. All right, thank you.